YouTube live to start um, and for people to log on. Thanks so much for joining us again, friends. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're logging in from. We're about to share our slides. I'm delighted today to be talking about something a little different than what we've been talking about over the last few months, um, something a little bit more specific. And so it's great for all of you who have some interest in art and design. Um, I have these esteemed guests from three very great institutions that give you an opportunity to um, to work on your art and um, create and develop. And so very excited for them to be there. They're gonna really quickly introduce themselves and then talk a little bit about our schools. And then we're gonna dive into um, what you've all been wondering about, how do we work on our portfolios? So um, without further ado, go ahead and introduce yourselves, guests. Hi, I'm Donald, I'm from OCAD University in Toronto. Hi, my name is Yoi Tanaka and I'm the Associate Dean of Admissions at Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles. Hi, my name is Isabel Sanchez. I'm an admissions officer and alumni from Rhode Island School of Design, RISD for short. Okay, and it's back to me. Um, again, my name is Donald. I'm Donald Kelly. I'm the manager of undergraduate admissions from OCAD University uh, in Toronto in the province of Ontario in Canada. Um, OCAD University is the oldest and largest art and design school in Canada. We were established in 1876. Um, we are located right downtown in the center of Toronto, and if you haven't been or if you're not familiar, Toronto is the biggest city in Canada. Um, from the image you see here on the screen, you might recognize the CN Tower. Uh, that's one of the most recognizable parts of the Toronto skyline. Uh, but our building that you also see in this picture has also become a very recognizable landmark in Toronto. It's on all of the city bus tours, architecture tours, um, the building up top that's black and white uh, is called the Sharp Center for Design. It houses most of our design programs. Underneath that, we have four floors of classrooms, um, and behind this building is our original building that was built in the 1920s. Uh, but again, <clears throat> we were established in 1876. Um, we're a very urban campus. Uh, like I said, we're right downtown in the center of the city. Uh, we do have 11 or 12, depending on how you count them, buildings spread out across a few city blocks. And you can see uh, on the side, um, it's my left side of the screen, uh, we offer all of these undergraduate programs. There's 17 different disciplines with some specializations available as well. We also offer graduate programs, uh, three degrees at each level, a Bachelor of Fine Arts, a Bachelor of Design or a Bachelor of Arts, which is an honors art history degree. And at the graduate level, we also offer a Master of Design, a Master of Fine Arts and a an MA. We're made up of over 4,700 students in total. That's across all programs, undergrad and graduate. Um, so we are large for an art school, uh, but in the scheme of universities in Canada, we are one of the smaller institutions. We have about a 21% international student population and over 500 faculty members, small class sizes, the majority are at least 30 or below, and we have about a 17 to one student to faculty ratio. I think I'll leave it there uh, in terms of the update or introduction to OCAD, and I'll pass it to my colleague, Yoy from Otis. Hi, everyone. Um, so Otis was the uh, first professional arts school in Southern California, established in 1918. Um, our campus is in the bottom right-hand corner there. This is a shot of the west side of Los Angeles. Our campus is located just a mile from the beach, so just south of Venice Beach in Santa Monica. Uh, we also have a partnership with LMU Loyola Marymount University, which does allow students to cross register for classes um, in many other subjects that we don't offer at Otis. Um, our Bachelor of Fine Arts majors are listed there. We also have 19 minors, so students are able to combine a major with a minor. Um, our largest program is digital media, which includes animation, game and entertainment design, and motion design. Uh, followed by fashion design and communication arts. We also have uh, a very specialty niche program in toy design, the only school in the world to offer a BFA in toy design, as well as an architecture, landscape, and interiors program, which combines all three of the spatial design fields. 
a multidiscipline product design program and an interdisciplinary fine arts program. Um, we have 1,100 students, 400 professional faculty members, and we're about 22% international, one of the most diverse colleges um, in the uni entire United States, um, very much representing the diversity that's represented in Los Angeles, um, which is a really great city to live in for art and design students if um, you're really interested in and connecting with museums and galleries and a very kind of vibrant art and culture scene. Um, at Otis too, we um, have a specialty minor in entrepreneurship and another in sustainability. So you are able to minor in areas outside of art and design. And um, for students, we're gonna really be talking to you about portfolio today, which we're really excited to connect with you on because it is such an important part of your application. And I'm gonna pass it over to Isabel from RISD. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I'm going to give you the briefest of in, um, introductions to Rhode Island School of Design, RISD again for short. Um, so RISD was founded by a small collective of women in 1877 and it has since grown to be one of the most influential art and design colleges in the world. Um, we're located about an hour south of Boston and about three hours north of New York. So we're close to um, international hubs. But yeah, Providence is this really great kind of smaller city with a really kind of close knit um, community feel to it. Uh, we have about 2,000 undergrad students and about 500 graduate students. And all first year students begin their RISD education in the Experimental and Foundation Studies program. Um, so everyone starts in that first year and then you choose your desired major in the spring semester of your first year and you're guaranteed a spot in whatever major you choose. Um, you, you then enter that major as a sophomore. Um, we offer 16 different majors. They're all four-year degrees where you graduate with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. With the exception of architecture, that is a five-year degree where you graduate with a professional Bachelor's of Architecture degree. Um, and at RISD, you, you work really closely with your instructors. We have a nine-to-one um, faculty to student or student to faculty ratio. Um, our professors are architects, entrepreneurs, researchers, activists, and more. Um, they've won Guggenheim fellowships, national design awards. Um, they have a great deal of, you know, discipline specific knowledge, but most of them work in an interdisciplinary way. And, you know, while you're at RISD, even though you choose one major, you, you really tend to work in an interdisciplinary way. Um, at RISD, learning is split across studio courses and liberal arts courses. So about a third of your credits will be in the liberal arts. Um, so it's all about just developing these creative problem solving skills, but also kind of um, enriching you know, your knowledge in the social sciences, art and design histories, et cetera. Um, and if you want more opportunities to take liberal arts classes, you actually can take classes at Brown University. Um, our campuses overlap and there's no additional tuition or additional admissions. Um, so again, all RISD students can take liberal arts classes at Brown University and those credits transfer back in as RISD credit. Um, yeah, we, so again, we share neighboring campuses, but we also, um, RISD students have access to Brown's libraries and facilities, and you'll be interacting socially, you know, you can attend their lectures, concerts, exhibits, there's a lot of joint collaboration as well. Um, we do also offer a joint program called the Brown RISD dual degree program. Um, so again, that's a separate joint five-year program where you're considered a full-time student at RISD and a full-time student at Brown and you end up earning two bachelor's degrees. So that is the briefest overview I can give about the dual degree program. So I can definitely take questions later if you have any about the dual degree program. Um, but I do want to mention that um, you know, RISD does also have a career center dedicated to and specializing in internships and jobs and opportunities in the creative field. I think that's the great thing about art schools in general is that, you know, art and design is what they do. It's what they know. And all of our resources and staff and faculty are dedicated to helping you pursue those goals in art and design. Um, 
And, you know, if you're interested in learning more about business as well, our Career Center has partnered with the Harvest Harvard Business School Online to offer RISD students access to their interactive online program. Um, it's called Credential of Readiness or CORE. And yeah, these courses help students gain these business skills and knowledge. So um, yeah, at RISD and beyond, you know, you're really supported by your community of artists, you know, your peers and your classes, professors, the staff and careers, even after you graduate. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Okay, so next we'll talk a bit about our um, institution's specific portfolio requirements, and then we'll get into some tips after that. Um, before I, I tell you about OCAD's uh, requirements specifically, I wanna mention that when you're applying to art and design schools or art and design programs um, in general, it's really important for you to make sure that you review and read thoroughly all the different requirements for the portfolio. Uh, each school might be slightly different. Uh, there is not one portfolio submission that can be used for every single school. You can definitely use elements from um, the images that you have to uh, create your portfolio. But again, each school's will be slightly different. For OCAD University, uh, for most of our programs, we're looking for eight to 10 examples of your best finished or finalized work. Um, you can include work in any medium that you would like to. Uh, we, we don't limit you on that. You can include traditional mediums, non-traditional video, photography, uh, whatever you want. Um, we do recommend that some of the work in your portfolio be related to the program that you're applying to, um, but we also want to see a variety. Uh, a statement of intent is required as part of the portfolio submission. So with that, we'll learn a bit about you what you hope to do, why you've chosen the program you've, you've chosen. Uh, we also want you to include examples of your process work or a sketchbook. Um, however you process your ideas, come up with your concepts, you can include images that inspire you in that piece of the portfolio, um, but it is a required element of the portfolio submission. And then I'll uh, pass it over to Yoi again. Hi, so at Otis, um, I do want to mention that we have a great kind of portfolio development page on our website at otis.edu slash portfolio. And new for this year, we have two options for the portfolio. One is the open portfolio requirement, which is just 10 to 20 images of your best work. It's up to you to decide uh, which pieces that you choose. It's open to all mediums. It can include um, sketchbook work or process-based work. Um, and again, it does not have to be tailored to a specific major of interest um, since all students will enter Otis um, into the foundation year program. Um, but we are looking for you to balance your kind of technical skills with your kind of creativity in terms of your, your concepts or your stories that you're exploring through your work. Um, if your work is mostly digital or lens based, then we do encourage you to submit five works done in other mediums. And then for the structured portfolio, which is new this year, and this is again, optional, not required. Um, if students are looking for a little bit more direction about what to submit for their portfolio um, and are looking for some prompts to help get them started, um, there's 10 images in total that you would create. And there's three different prompts for three images, four images, and three images. Um, and these can be done in any medium, executed in any way that you would prefer technically. They're just kind of giving you some kind of prompts and ideas to get started on um, building out these three different series. And you can also include any of these um, prompts in your open portfolio. And I'll go ahead and pass it off to Isabel. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, just to kind of echo what, what Donald mentioned, um, I definitely recommend that any school you're interested in applying to, definitely be sure to check in with them because every school looks for something slightly different. Um, so for RISD, we do ask that you include 12 to 20 examples um, really of your strongest work. And we purposely leave our requirements really open-ended because we wanna see what you're genuinely interested in. Um, but in general, we wanna see your creativity, your, your kind of point of view, um, your kind of unique take on the way you connect with art or design. Um, 
yeah, we really want to see what you're interested and passionate about. Um, I kind of think of the sweet spot as using your technical skill, that is, you know, your choice of composition, texture, mark making, um, space, lighting, you know, using all of those really intentionally and using them to convey a sense of mood or uh, maybe a story or a, a kind of idea, you know, kind of using those skills to then say something or show something. Um, so that's just some things to think about. Um, also think about that all first year students at RISD do start in that experimental and foundation studies where you're gonna be encouraged to mess with your process, to try all different materials and ways of working. So it's really great for us to see that kind of um, curiosity and that kind of experimentation in your portfolio as well. Um, so don't feel that you have to gear your work towards one major or one discipline. It's great for us to see all the different types of ways you like to work. Um, but of course, most important, we want to see the work that you think is your most interesting work. Um, in addition to the portfolio, we do ask that you respond to the RISD assignment. And keep in mind this kind of visual assignment changes every year. And this is a separate um, visual requirement. It, it's separate from the portfolio. So you'll put this in a separate place in Slide Room, which is um, the online platform where, where you'll upload your portfolio. We'll talk more about that later. Um, but this year, um, our assignment is to identify something that's in need of repair and use any material or approach to fix it. Um, so the first part will be a visual response. And then we ask for just a short, you know, less than a page, you know, shorter is better um, kind of response that tells us a little bit about your um, creative process and the choices you made. Um, and again, we purposely make these very open-ended, very general, because we really want to see how you take this assignment and make it interesting and specific to your interests. Um, so in general, no matter what the RISD assignment is, if you know you apply next year or the year after, in general, we wanna see how you take an assignment and make it interesting to you. Yes, so I believe this is mine, yeah? Okay, just double checking. <laughs> um, so now we want to just give you some tips um, to kind of help you with um, putting together your portfolio. And like I mentioned before, of course, we're all looking for some, all, all the schools are looking for something slightly different. But these are tips that are just kind of general things to keep in mind that will help you with preparing your portfolio for an art and design school. So, of course, you know, familiar, familiarize yourself with a digital platform you'll submit and all three of our schools represented today use slide room. Um, so most art schools do. Um, and the way it works is that you'll start your application um, for most schools through the common app and then that will lead you to slide room and there'll be an area where you can upload your image and then you'll have the opportunity to provide the title, maybe the medium and the size and any kind of additional information off to the side. So it kind of happens in two separate places and definitely make sure that you proofread before you hit submit. Um, so even in your description, maybe have another person just look over it to make sure there's no typos. And, um, you know, you certainly don't have to write a whole long artist statement, but just a little bit of context is helpful. Yeah, and it's really great for us to see, you know, we really want to see your work as clearly as possible. You know, we don't get to, you know, see your work in person. So it's important to document your work in a way that shows it clearly and kind of in the best light. So as, as much as you can, take high quality, well-lit photos. Um, if you maybe have smaller drawings, maybe scanning them in would work, um, would work better. Um, you know, another kind of tip you can use is maybe take your artwork outside, find a evenly shaded area, take a photo of it there. Um, but try your best, you know, especially if you have three-dimensional work, um, to use a neutral background, you know, black, white, or gray, just so we can keep all of our attention on your work. And if you do make a three-dimensional piece, it is helpful for us, again, to see 
you know, different angles because we don't get to see it in person. So kind of helping us understand what it's, what it looks like is really, is really great. Um, definitely document your work as you go. So, you know, even if you plan on working back into a piece, it doesn't hurt to kind of take a, a high quality photo of it um, just so that you have it just in case, I don't know, you spill coffee on your drawing or something like that. So that's a really, really great tip. Um, and think, and keep in mind when putting together your images, less is more, you know, we really want to focus on the work. So try not to make a very busy design of the layout. And just to kind of keep adding to that last tip, um, again, we really just want to, you know, see your work the best we can. So I would really discourage um, making these really kind of densely cluttered, many imaged slides. Um, it's really difficult for us to kind of see and appreciate your work if you kind of put so much information in one slide. So again, with your portfolio, it's not meant to show us every single thought or sketch or piece you've ever made. It's meant to be a highly edited selection of your strongest work. So you're going to have to edit things out of what you include in your portfolio. Um, also, please put any kind of text descriptions, in the area, in the designated area of slide room, don't put the descriptions or titles in the actual image in the slide. Um, again, we just want to focus on your artwork, so that kind of becomes distracting. Um, so be sure that you're you're mindful with how you upload your work. And I'll just say one note too: there there is a character limit for the description field in slide room, and that's because it's intentional, it's not meant to be a full essay about each piece in your portfolio, keep it concise. Um, we, we review thousands of images um, each, each season. So um, definitely be to the point um, and get your, your idea across uh, quickly and, and uh, concisely. Definitely. So portfolio tip three is to really kind of think about the curation and the selection of the pieces that you're going to include in your portfolio. You might think that, oh, 20 pieces is just too few. I have so many strong um, um, examples of artwork to include. And that's where Isabel's point of, of really being intentional about the pieces that you're selecting is very important. It's not really intended to show your growth over time as an artist. Um, so don't include things that are that are really old or not your kind of current best work. Um, so really think about your organization in terms of how you are going to group and organize your images for Slide Room. We are going to kind of click through your images in the order that you upload them. So be intentional and really play to your strengths when you're thinking about the pieces that you're including. Um, so these are just a few ideas of how you can organize your portfolio. Maybe you have two different series or concentrations that you're working on. One has five images, the next one has seven images. Maybe you have three different mediums that you're specifically focusing on. So maybe drawings, paintings, and ceramic sculptures. Uh, maybe you have some really nice sketchbook examples or process work that you then complete with examples of finished work. Um, maybe it's focusing on observational kind of figure drawing work and then kind of going into your more creative pieces. So these are just a few examples of how you can organize, but definitely be intentional. Sometimes it's really helpful to um, kind of print out and lay out kind of um, just snaps of all of the different pieces that you think you want to include. Um, students are often judged for the best and the worst pieces in their portfolio. And sometimes there's like one piece that really kind of stands out like a sore thumb. And that's typically the piece to pull out of your portfolio. There's a reason why it kind of doesn't fit with everything else um, that is in your portfolio. And you know, it can sometimes be helpful to get a portfolio review. Um, admissions offices are often offering portfolio reviews virtually now. Um, so getting feedback on your work beyond you know, your classmates and your teacher can kind of give you 
um, added insight into which images to include. And it's important to note that because every school does have different portfolio requirements, your portfolio submission might look different for each institution you're applying to. And that's totally okay. Um, and oftentimes too, you might be working on things for class. Um, so we oftentimes get this question like, oh, if I'm working on this for my AP portfolio, can I include this in my um, college application? And the answer is yes, we're not expecting you to make an entirely different body of work, but there might be additional pieces that you're adding to the portfolio, maybe a, a different series that you're working on independently as well. And the next tip kind of goes in line with this, and this is really to develop um, a series in your portfolio, at least at least one. Uh, a series is really a collection of artworks. It might also be a concentration that you explore kind of the same theme or narrative. Um, these are three pieces which were displayed individually, but I've kind of combined them here on the same slide for you on self-care, which is I think something that's really important right now for everyone. So hopefully you're, you're taking care of yourself. Um, but you'll see that it is very consistent in terms of medium and style. There is a progression from each piece to the next. Um, and they use the slide room descriptions to explain more about their concept and their ideas behind these pieces and a little bit about their process as well. And that's where um, having a series um, can be really effective in showing us that you can delve deeply into an idea or a concept it shows depth in your portfolio. Um, so it is definitely highly encouraged um, and hopefully you're working towards that right now. Okay, and our portfolio tip five is to do with process work and research. Um, I mentioned earlier that OCAD University would like to see a sketchbook as one piece in your portfolio. Um, some other schools want to see a sample of process work. Um, again, it will depend on the school. Um, but this is the place, you know, where you keep um, the things that you've worked on before you get to a finished or finalized piece. It's where you experiment with different materials. It's where you practice making different kinds of marks um, on a page. Uh, it's where you write about your work, where you include research. Um, it's really the messy piece behind your finished work. And further on that, it can be messy. We're not expecting a sketchbook that includes a, a highly finished uh, portrait that you've done every day or one day, one day a week, something like that. It's, it's really meant to be messy. Um, in terms of presenting it as part of your portfolio in the slide room submission, there's a couple of options. Uh, you can scan different pages of your sketchbook or from multiple sketchbooks, edit them together into one PDF to upload into Sliderum. Uh, at OCAD, and I believe with some other institutions, um, we also will accept a short video of you flipping through pages of your sketchbook. So you lay the sketchbook on a table, you film from above with you flipping through the different pages. It really allows us to see sort of the textural qualities of what that sketchbook is or what that process book is. Um, it's also important to know with your sketchbook or with your research and development work, how to edit. So some of us will wanna see a lot of process work. Some will only wanna see a little bit. Um, so you kind of need to self-select, self-edit things that make sense, things that tie back into finished pieces in your portfolio, if that's a requirement of the school, things that show experimentation and, and stuff that you may not have included in your finished portfolio is also okay to include. You can also include a, a digital sketchbook. So if you're a person who doesn't work uh, with pencil on paper or something physical like that, you can include digital files as well that shows your process as you're working through to your finalized piece. And our portfolio tip number six is uh, to be creative. Um, show us who you are, so show us your personality. And I think the most important part is to have fun. Um, it can be stressful, we get it. Um, all of us have been through this before, all three of us, I believe. We are all graduates from, from art and design schools. Um, so we know what it's like, uh, but it, it is important to have fun as well. Um, 
you're showing us who you are, your personality, um, the skills that you have, your potential fit for the school and the program that we offer, um, your how serious you are about attending an art and design school. Um, you have to think about whether a school uh, that specializes or focuses in art and design um, is the type of school for you when you're creating your portfolio, when you're putting your work together, or if you want to study fine art or design at a larger institution that just has a fine arts department. Both are great, both offer different things. Um, again, in terms of being creative and showing off who you are, the portfolio really helps you stand out as an applicant. It's really what we look at, it's your visual story, um, and it shows us your suitability for our respective institutions. All right, so we did have a question about what types of careers or paths do students that attend art and design schools go into? Um, and this is one of my favorite slides in our Otis presentation, which is talks about the different companies where students do internships and go on to work after graduation. Um, and of course, very well represented in the city of LA in terms of the types of companies. Um, and so you might become a product designer designing interiors of Tesla's, you might become an animator at Pixar, Disney, Cartoon Network, or DreamWorks. You might be doing visual effects or motion design work for a show on Netflix. You might be designing shoes for Nike or the, you know, outside of an iPhone for Apple or a fashion designer at Vince. Um, so many other kind of opportunities and the path isn't always kind of very clear and, and linear all the time when you are in art and design. Um, and sometimes you're forging your own path. Many artists and designers go on to start their own companies or studios um, or become entrepreneurs. Um, and so there's so many, many different opportunities um, in the various art and design fields and majors that our institutions offer. And as um, Isabel mentioned as well, we do, each of our, our colleges has a career services department, which is there and specialized in these creative industries. So it's not kind of generalized. Um, they specifically know um, the folks at these types of companies, what is expected when you're going into a field like animation versus fashion design or toy design how your applications need to look different, how your, your process of applying to these internships and jobs is not gonna be like applying for a traditional job. Oftentimes there's going to be um, a portfolio that you might have to submit or having a kind of portfolio review or interview. So this process that we're talking about, about applying to an art and design school and building a portfolio is something that you will kind of continue uh, throughout your career. Um, I think it is also important to note out there for students whose maybe parents aren't fully on board with them pursuing a, a creative career, that these industries as well and these types of positions, um, considering the future of, of, the, of work and job automation, becoming an artist and designer is actually much more kind of foolproof than say becoming an accountant these days. Um, so it's definitely something to keep in mind and take into consideration. In Los Angeles County alone, there's 790,000 people that work in some sort of creative industry position or, or job. And we actually do a study at Otis every year of the economic impact on the state of California and on LA County of the creative industries. And it is huge. Also, when you factor in the tech industries as well. Um, and I'll pass it off to Isabel, who has some other words on this subject, too. Thank you. Yes, I completely agree that, you know, a, an education in art and design teaches you to think creatively, it teaches you to problem solve, which has so much more applications than you might at first imagine. Um, so for example, um, one company that hires a lot of RISD alumni is Philips Healthcare. Um, and that's, you know, hiring industrial designers to design how their customers navigate their apps or their websites. So you can be designing this user experience, for example. Um, but yeah, you know, of course, you know, being a graphic designer, um, that's definitely um, what you might expect. Sorry for background noise. 
um, but also um, yeah. there is, uh, you know, you can pursue, um, you know, working in a gallery, you know, there's definitely opportunities for fine artists like fellowships, grants, residencies. Um, RISD is one of the top Fulbright producing specialty colleges in the country, so you can definitely pursue um, a Fulbright, for example. Um, but I just love coming across examples of artists and designers who kind of go off in these unexpected directions. Um, so for example, one RISD textile student went on to co-found EmboNet. Um, so what that is, is she, she works alongside biomedical engineers at Brown University to create knit medical devices for aortic bypass surgeries. So, you know, that's certainly not what you first expect someone in textiles to, you know, go into the medical industry. So a lot of different, you know, you can really choose your own kind of career path, you know, combine your different interests, draw on your education and problem solving and thinking creatively. Um, and that's kind of the exciting thing about art and design too, is that it has so much flexibility to kind of create your own job. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there and we can kind of circle back to talking more about applications. These were wonderful tips um, and just thank you again for sharing them and kind of giving people a sense of what to be expecting in this process. Um, and so uh, just a quick reminder, if you have questions, now is the time to ask. You can type in the Q&A box. And if you're on YouTube, you can type in the chat as well. I can see that. Um, we do have a few questions already, so I'm going to just dive in. But uh, feel free to keep asking as we go. Um, one, one question I'll start off with. I think there are people in the audience that may enjoy art. Um, may enjoy being creative, but maybe aren't um, sure that an art and a design school is the way to go, or, you know, should they go to a more traditional university liberal arts kind of education and take some art classes? Like what, what do you think, um, uh, who is the suitable art and design student? <laughs> That's, that's a really good question. And I think that's exactly the question you know, you should be asking as you're starting to apply to schools, um, especially since art and design schools are very intensive. You know, your, your art classes, your studio classes will be hours long, kind of taking up the majority of your day. So it's not like maybe a traditional high school art class where maybe it's 45 minutes, like, like my education was in high school. You know, it's, it's much more of a deep dive. It's much more immersive. Um, so I think it depends on how immersive of an, of an experience you want. Um, and I think you also need to, to, ha to have that hunger and curiosity to be constantly making and, you know, challenging how you make art and design. I think if you like working one way, you don't really, it gives you a lot of pleasure. You don't really want to change it then I think maybe just taking art classes at um, maybe a university or a liberal arts school would be a better fit. But I think if you really want to be surrounded by other people who are also visual thinkers, who are also very creative, then an art and design school is definitely the place for you to have this kind of really inspiring um, community of, of, of students. Yeah, I think community is um, a really kind of important point. A lot of students are coming from kind of more traditional high schools where, you know, there may have been only a few like really serious art and design kids in their school. Um, and then they come to the communities that are, you know, at art and design colleges where everyone is a creative on campus. And they finally feel like, oh, I found my place. I found my community. I found the, you know, a group of people that are really going to help push my work to the next level. I found collaborators and lots of different majors that are really expanding my kind of perspective and view on art and design. Um, faculty at art and design colleges too, a lot of them, you know, are working professionals who have their own kind of design careers, they're gallery represented artists, they're teaching there because they love it. 
Um, and they're also, you know, teaching what's what's relevant and what's appropriate for students who are going to be entering into the creative industries. Um, I think too, the portfolio is a really good kind of um, test and experiment too. If, if you don't enjoy kind of the work that it takes to build a portfolio, then going to an art and design school may not be kind of the right path for you. And that's totally fine. Um, you know, I think that a lot of students um, also kind of find out whether this is the right path for them by doing summer pre-college programs, mm -hmm. uh, intensives over the summer where you're spending maybe four weeks um, on a campus or even online uh, where you're focusing on this one area very deeply and intensively and kind of getting a feel for those six hour long studio classes. And if, if, if that's something that you really feel passionate about. Wonderful. Well, um, as as is often the case, there's a question about competitiveness. <laughs> um, what makes a student competitive in this process? Um, you know, and maybe like um, we we on Tuesday talks often talk about holistic review, um, but you know, if there's a way, I know there's no formula per se, but kind of like grades versus portfolio versus other things in the application process like what makes a student competitive and how are you kind of looking at all of those components i'm happy to <laughs> just start out the, <laughs> the answer um i think probably all of us would um you know from each school would probably say that your portfolio your your visual elements are going to be the most 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 important part of your application. Um, but I'll kind of speak to RISD in terms of what we look for, what, yeah, kind of gives someone an edge. Um, yeah, I would say portfolio visual stuff is the most important. Then we'll look at your grades on your transcript. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, then we kind of really look at everything. We look at what you've been up to. We look at you as an individual, definitely read your common app essay. Um, and actually RISD is hosting a webinar tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, we'll have a recording too, if that time doesn't work for your schedule, um, about tips on writing your common app essay. So if that's something that is giving you some trouble, definitely attend that. I'll, I'll add a link below. But um, so I think that is just great to help us get to know you even better because, you know, as you were saying, yeah, that kind of holistic looking at everything, trying to just get a sense of what makes you, you and what is interesting to you, what you're passionate about. That's, that's what we're looking for at, at RISD. And, and I think to be really more specific, we're looking for people with curiosity who are inquisitive, who aren't content to just kind of reproduce what they've seen before, but want to kind of take make their own mark on things and put their own spin on things. Um, so if you make work that we've never seen before, that's always really exciting. I, I don't think that's a good place um, to like sit down at a desk and be like, hmm, what art can I make that's never been made before? But it's much more about just following your interests and really pushing them further and further, following those different tangents um, and not worrying if your work looks different than other people's. That's really good. That's great to see. Um, so that's that's kind of what RISD is looking for. Um, I can pass it along to whoever wants to talk next. <laughs> I can say a couple of words. I, I really would um, echo a lot of what Isabel just said. Um, for OCAD specifically, um, we look at the portfolio. That's really what is the indicator for us as to whether or not you receive an offer of admission. Grades are important as well, um, but we, we have a process where we look at the portfolio first and the portfolio includes your statement of intent um, and the write-ups that you've done about each of your pieces. Um, that's what we use to make the decision. Um, we look at the academics or your transcripts or language tests after, and we have minimum requirements, minimum cutoffs, which are fairly low, um, but it, it really is the portfolio earns you an offer. If your portfolio doesn't show us, you know, your passion, your curiosity, your skill, um, then you might not earn an offer of admission, even though you meet the academic requirements. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll just kind of echo what Isabel and Donald said is that the portfolio is a really kind of key aspect of your application. And I think most art design institutions will agree. But we do need to know that you can be academically successful at the college level as well. Um, you know, there are quite a few art design students that maybe like math is not like their strong suit. And, you know, they might have a kind of weaker grade in certain subjects. And, and we totally get that, you know, the kind of traditional schooling system and standardized tests are not necessarily geared towards folks that um, come from more kind of creative backgrounds. Um, so we do kind of look in that look at your academic record in context. Um, but the, you know, the statement can be a really great place to kind of um, provide some of those additional details if you have any have had any challenges academically. Um, and I do know, you know, quite a few students were challenged by, you know, COVID-19 and switching to online learning. And um, in the Common App, there is a place now where you can kind of indicate if you did have those challenges. Um, I think there is a bit of, um, of leniency in terms of how we're evaluating applications this cycle, knowing that uh, for portfolios, for students' kind of academic records, there, there might be some inconsistencies that we haven't seen or issues with doing standardized testing, which is, um, you know, it's great that we added Duolingo um, so students are able to kind of do that. And so I think that, you know, the bottom line is, especially this year, kind of institutions are being more kind of flexible and, and considerate of, of all the different scenarios that different students, especially international students, um, have had to go through. Thank you. Sorry, could I just oh, add go one ahead, more Donald. thing? Yeah. Um, just because it's come up a couple of times, um, the common app, OCAD doesn't use. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's primarily uh, US, US or uh, American schools. <laughs> Um, there's a separate provincial application for the province of Ontario. There's 21 universities in the province and we all use that application. It's called the Ontario Universities Application Center, aptly named. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for clarifying that. Um, no. So, <laughs> so um, there are some specific um, some specific questions about certain types of, you know, um, portfolios, you know, for like, let's say architecture versus animation versus, and so I'm, I'm wondering, um, where's the best way to kind of get insight on what, what requirements there might be, or maybe not, or maybe not requirements, but recommendations or suggestions, you know, like some people are wondering, you know, do you need to see like all sorts of mediums here or is for a specific kind of interest, should I just focus on, you know, 3D models versus, you know, like where, where can people find that information? I can kind of jump into this one. Um, so, all of our institutions, I believe, are institutions that have a first year foundation year. So students are, are not necessarily going directly into a major, but you might be applying to institutions where you are applying specifically to a major, say like fashion design, and they might require a fashion specific portfolio and they would kind of list those requirements on their website. Like we need to see X, Y, Z if you're applying to this program. Same for, you know, animation programs, et cetera. If you are applying to schools like ours that have more general portfolio requirements and you do have a major in mind and you have started making work that's in line with that major of interest, it's always great to see that type of work in your portfolio. Um, but we also don't want students who maybe say haven't had a lot of, of experience in architecture to feel like they're kind of severely disadvantaged in the kind of application process. Um, so from my perspective, I love seeing students that are that are really passionate about say animation or um, whatever it is that they're interested in. I think it can show um, depth in a portfolio can show kind of focus. It, they might have really great projects or series or concentrations that they've been kind of working on. But it's also okay if you've just been kind of working um, in lots of different mediums, you've been exploring lots of ways of making. Because, you know, we're at our institutions, you're going to come in and we're going to help you to kind of build those skills that you need and kind of find your path into a major um, so again, every school is going to be a little bit different at what they look for. 
Thank you for that. Um, I think there's some questions, you know, we have varying levels of ability when it comes to art, maybe because of access to art classes and, and whatnot. So in terms of um, potential, <laughs> um, you know, like I think there are people asking, am I at a disadvantage if I didn't have any art classes at, in high school? Or, you know, is there, if I if I have kind of aspirations of wanting to do graphic design, for example, but I haven't had um, access to kind of some of the tools, um, but, you know, I have good ideas. Like what, how, how can that be presented to you in, in the portfolio? Like how do you, how, how are you able to um, pinpoint maybe kind of potential versus like achievement? I think it might be helpful by first saying that at, at least for RISD, we are only going to be evaluating your fit for RISD, your kind of visual skills, let's say, for lack of a, a better term, through your portfolio. And we're not going to evaluate that through how many art classes you have or haven't taken. If anything, we will look at each applicant as an individual. We'll see you know, have you had access to lots and lots of art classes, to many pre-college programs? For that applicant, we're going to have kind of a higher expectation of their portfolio. We'll, we'll expect that with, because it's had so much, that students had so much support, that their work should be a little bit more developed and, and a little further along. Um, whereas maybe, you know, maybe we'll have an applicant who hasn't really had the opportunity to take any art classes at high school or otherwise. Um, for that applicant, we're not going to have that same expectation of development. We're going to be looking, yeah, for that potential and maybe um, like the technical skill here and there could be developed. Um, so we're going to look at each, each person as an individual. Um, and I wouldn't worry too much if you hadn't if you haven't had as much access to classes. I mean, I think sometimes it can be great to be self-taught because, you know, then you're not kind of subscribing to maybe a formula. You know, it's great to see what happens when students are left to their own devices. Um, yeah, that, that's just some things to keep in mind as well. Um, but I can definitely pass it along to anyone else. <laughs> Um, there's a question here from on the YouTube live as well. Um, uh, how does one, you know, I think there's still a question of like, do we have to apply to a certain major? I think there's still some on like some clarity that needs to be given. Like, are you able to apply for kind of an undecided type major at an art and design school or a foundations course or a yeah. yeah, so at Otis, um, all, all freshmen will enter the foundation year, um, which is the first year out of four years, um, and students are able to really kind of select different types of classes based upon the major they think they want to go into. Um, a lot of times our InDesign students haven't been kind of fully exposed to the range of majors that are offered um, at art and design institutions at the high school level, because most of the time high school art classes are very drawing and painting focused and we know everyone's not going to become a fine arts major. Um, so it is really great to have that flexibility to come in undeclared um, and then to learn more about the different programs, um, see the type of work students are making, learn about the faculty and what the career outcomes are. Um, but there are some institutions out there where you are entering into a major from day one and you are applying to that program. And those are, are, are more often than not the institutions that have a major specific portfolio requirement. Um, and those um, programs tend to be kind of more specialized and kind of more focused in that, in that one area, again, from day one. It can sometimes be a little bit hard for students to change majors once they enter an institution in that program. So it's typically best for students that are super confident, they know this is the direction that they wanna go into. So then do students pick their major at the end of their foundation year? Yeah, at Otis, it'll be in the spring semester. So their second semester, 
Um, there's um, kind of, you know, different series of events where to help students actually learn more about the different programs. And then they select a major as well as a minor if they're declaring one. I, I would just like to add, um, it sounds like RISD and Otis have kind of a similar um, path that students follow. Um, I do just want to clarify that um, when you apply to RISD through the common application, you will have the option to indicate what your anticipated major is, but that is not binding. That will not affect your admissions. We will not hold you to that. That's just for um, really for our own kind of data collection. Um, we find that the vast majority of students at RISD end up later declaring a different major than their anticipated major when they first apply. Um, so that's one of the main reasons why we ask that um, on the common application, but there is also that option to put undecided. But all um, first year applicants to RISD enter RISD undecided, declare their major in the spring semester of their first year, and then enter that major as a sophomore. Um, if you know you want to like definitely follow this one path and that's where your interests are, um, you can kind of kind of um, have your portfolio lean towards that discipline or that interest. That's fine. Um, but maybe, you know, for RISD, it's great for us to see a variety of processes and a variety of approaches, even if it's within one discipline like architecture or photography, vary your process, even if it's within that one area. Uh, but that's, so that's just some things to keep in mind for, for RISD in particular. And I'll just add uh, to this a bit. Um, OCAD is kind of an anomaly <laughs> in <our laughs> anomaly, um, because we offer both. Uh, we have some programs that are direct entry. So you start in them uh, from day one, those are mostly our design programs, one of our fine arts disciplines and our interdisciplinary programs. Um, but we do offer some programs that begin with a common first year. So uh, an example of that is photography or sculpture and sort of the more traditional fine arts based programs. Um, that being said, within our programs, the way we've structured them and we're going through a complete curriculum overhaul right now to make things more open and interdisciplinary and exploratory. Um, you'll have some courses that are, are um, in your major, but in the first year, but you'll have electives, you'll have other courses so you can explore and see what other things might be available to you. Um, so yes, you are choosing a major um, and you will be in that major, but you can change it at a later date and those courses will, will move through you throughout your, your education. If you've chosen a program that has that common first year, you will officially request your major um, in your second semester of the first year. Thank you for that. And as a reminder to everyone, every Tuesday Tech, we talk, we talk about this, like it's important for you to look at the institution's website because while there are some commonalities, there are also differences <laughs> in the way that both the application process and the actual curriculum um, are set up. So um, yeah, well, we have just a little bit of time left. So I just wanted to give each of you um, just a second here, if you wanted to give some parting words of advice or, <laughs> or any words of encouragement before we say goodbye today. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think I really wanna echo one of the tips that, that Donald mentioned before of having fun. <laughs> I think that, um, it, it, it sounds counterintuitive, you know, you want to be really serious and, you know, mindful about how you put together, you know, your applications, but at the same time, I don't, I don't know why, but when you have fun making a piece of work, it tends to lead to more interesting, more engaged final outcomes. So, hey, try it. Um, and then the last kind of piece of advice I would give is, um, just to follow your interests, kind of make as much art as you can. And don't worry about what art pieces you're going to put in your portfolio just yet. Just make your work, you know, build off of any good ideas and kind of follow them. Um, kind of like Yoi was mentioning, you know, work in series and kind of keep developing these good ideas. And then you can take a step back just before you put together your portfolio. And once you take that step back, that's when you can decide 
what pieces to include, what pieces not to include. I personally find that making interesting work and then curating that work, deciding what's strong, what isn't, I, I find that those processes happen best when they happen separately. Um, so yeah, so keep uh, keep making art and, and have fun as much as you can. <laughs> I think my suggestion would just be don't be afraid to get a portfolio review. Um, since we are offering them virtually, this is, you know, a rare opportunity for international students. Um, hopefully it will just kind of continue to happen in this way, but um, there is a little bit of kind of practice that kind of goes into it though. So definitely make sure that you've selected your images in advance, that you've kind of documented them, that you kind of save them to a specific folder or throw them into, you know, a Google slideshow, um, practice sharing screen on whatever platform it is that you're going to use. And, you know, definitely take advantage of that though. It's, it's definitely important and it'll help you look at your work in a different way. Not sure that I really have anything to add. Both of those are really great uh, tips and pretty much exactly what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it's been really fun having you all on this panel once again. And um, thanks for sharing all these great tips. And everyone, make sure you reach out. The, the contact information is here. Um, <clears throat> all three would be happy to answer your questions, especially about their specific institutions. Um, so yeah, and then in the meantime, we'll see you all next Tuesday. Enjoy, enjoy your evening <laughs> for most of you. <laughs> all right, have a good day. Bye all. Right, thank you. Bye. Bye, thanks. <laughs>